this is why the the differential operator is looking at the spectrum, and the best way to do that is to define some spectral function, some spectral invariant, and then to study to what extent do they describe the geometry. So that's the typical uh, spectral geometry question. And the standard approach has been uh, to look at so-called heat kernel and heat trace and the corresponding invariants that define uh, heat kernel. And, uh, in this talk, we define new invariants. So the goal of my study is to introduce and study new invariants of some differential operators, and then the results are that uh, one can reduce those invariants to the known ones, and then to compute the asymptotics of the new invariants. So here is uh, the motivation. The type of operators I'll be studying are called Laplace type operators. So these are second order uh, linear self conjoint. Uh, Partial differential operators, uh, which I will assume uh, that are positive. And so, if you take uh, an average, there is self conjoint uh, partial differential operator of second order with scalar linear symbol acting on some vector bundle of sort. Uh, the vector bundle over uh, some complex invariant manifold with or without boundary. And there is a way to present it in a Laplace type form. So, by choosing a Connection on the vector bundle and some uh, mental models in the metric uh, on that manifold. So any operator with scalar limit symbol has this form of second order. So the only additional assumption is that you know, if I assume it's positive, but without loss of generality, I can assume that this endomorphism is large enough so that uh, this operator is positive definitely. The eigenvalues of such an operator uh, uh, they give you a discrete set of real positive numbers and that are increasing and unbounded. So and basically we try to use that sequence to describe the underlying geometry of the manifold. So here is the motivation. So first of all you study uh, you, you look at that operator and so if I divide it by two L with some positive parameter, I could interpret this as a non-relativistic uh, Hamiltonian of some particle of mass f. And then if I look at the classical, uh, well, the ensemble of thermodynamic equilibrium at temperature T, then the total number of particles is given by the Boltzmann distribution. And so we should just sum. These are the eigenvalues of this operator. And it's expressed in this theta, which is called the classical heat trace. So this is a L2 trace of the heat semi group of the operator F, H. So that's the classical thing, classical heat kernel that everybody knows. And uh, basically, what has been extensively studied are the short time asymptotics of this invariant. But I want to define a generalization of this invariant. And so, what we do, we define a square root of the operator. So, this is a pseudo differential operator of first order. And it's also positive definite. And I'm going to interpret it as a an Antonian of a relativistic particle, and then the total number of classical relativistic particles will be given by this trace, which I call the relativistic heat trace. So this is an L2 trace of a heat semi group of a pseudo differential operator of first order. So this omega k is a square root of that lambda k, which are the eigenvalues of that Laplace type operator. So it will be interested in asymptotics of this new invariant. This is, this is a new invariant. And the quantum heat traces are defined as follows. Now I can see the quantum particles. And since they're indistinguishable particles, and that's the additional property, if you compare it to classical particles, then, uh, well, as everybody knows, there are two types of that bosons and fermions. And then the total number of particles is given by the Bose Einstein and Derived distribution. And so this is nothing but the L2 traces of this expression where omega is that pseudo differential operator that I define. Beta is the inverse temperature, and mu is the, well, some negative parameter that we could call chemical tension. So these are new invariants that I'm going to call uh, quantum heat traces. And of course, for, you know, if this is large, for uh, large energies, this would be used to the standard voice. So the high energy spectrum of that is covered by the classical heat trace. But if you look at the whole trace, then uh, it's new in 
And so what I would be interested in, what are the asymptotics of this as a given goes to zero, so asymptotically. And that's what uh, we're gonna do. Well, this is a so-called zeta function, the spectral zeta function, classical zeta function is defined as follows. They take the classical t trace and they take the t in the form, divide by the gamma function, you get what is called the delta trace of the complex power of the number H, and that's the classical spectral zeta function. Analytical properties of that are very important in the defining the determinant of the upper and quantum field theory and many other things. And so in an analogy of this, I'm going to define the relativistic zeta function in bosonic and fermionic quantum zeta functions. So and one can show that both of these quantum zeta functions can be expressed in terms of the relativistic zeta function. Here it is. And the, the uh, Q zeta is the Riemann zeta function. So, in other words, both bosonic and periodic zeta function are expressed in terms of the relativistic zeta function when omega is a pseudo-differential number. So, you can define this thing and study analytical properties of as uh, complex uh, functions of the complex variable of x. Okay, and here is the key uh, ingredient of our approach. We look at the Heat kernel, classical heat kernel of the operand H for plus type operand. We take the heat trace, this is classical heat trace, and then we take the uh, Billy transform, well, modified type Billy transform. This N is the dimension of the manifold, and well, this is introduced for convenience, and then uh, you divide by the gamma function. And then one can prove that this function as a function of complex variable Q is an entire function of Q. And that's the key for everything that follows. So this is an entire function of Q, and well, there is something, there are some details that I'm skipping. And once you have this, then you can express the classical heat trace in terms of that by inverting this Milin transform. And so you get this, what I call Milin balanced representation of the classical heat curl in terms of that uh, entire function. Notice the presence of this gamma function. This gamma function has poles that posit the integer balance of Q. And that's it will be important for this. So basically, if you look at this integral and you take that contour configuration and move it to the right, it will get all the poles coming from this gamma function and it will give you this canonical dimension sundaram for the general asymptotic expansion of the classical heat trace. So this is the celebrated uh, asymptotic expansion of the classical heat trace. And here these coefficients, a, k, are the well-known, or sometimes they call the real silly, guilty heat kernel coefficients. And the most important part is that they are locally computable polynomial curvature variants. In other words, they are given by the integrals of, the first one is just the volume, the second is integral of scalar curvature, the second is, uh, the third is integral of some higher variance of curvature and so on, but they are all locally computable and, you know, they are known up to A4 and A5 in some cases, but well, I computed A4, and it occupies, you know, pages, but you can compute it. So they are known, okay? And the values of this, and, and this is nothing but the values of this function has positive integer values of Q. So this is a function of, entire function of complex variable Q such that for positive values it's just equal to the heat kernel coefficient. But the values of half integer points like this and the derivatives and integer points, they are not locally computed. These are new invariants. Okay, so this will be uh, well new invariants that are coming later. So and now Given this, I can express the classical zeta function, the relativity, all the zeta functions in terms of that function. So in other words, I can compute that Milin transform and exactly and I can express all the zeta function in terms of that function. And that, since this is entire function, that is the complete analytical structure of all the zeta functions, all the way to, they're basically meromorphic functions of that. And I know exactly where the poles, where the simple poles, and what kind of residues, and everything else. So, just in terms of that one uh, function. 